Hello, welcome. Uh, thank you all for braving the weather. Um, my name is Dan D'Amico. I'm the associate director at the Political Theory Project. We're the, we're the hosts for this evening. Um, we're joined by uh, Professor Glenn Wheel. He is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England, where he works on political economy in the 19th century from an interdisciplinary perspective. His most recent book, uh, not yet out until the 15th, but you can buy it in the lobby right now, um, entitled Radical Markets, um, Radical Markets, Uprooting Capitalism and Democracy for a Just Society. Um, the substance of this work fits perfectly within the mission of the Political Theory Project, which is uh, to pursue uh, and invigorate the study of ideas and institutions that make societies free, prosperous, and fair. Um, so please join me in welcoming Professor Glenn Wheel. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dan, and to everybody else who helped organize this and to everyone who came uh, in spite of, I guess, both uh, Jeb Bush being here and uh, the rain. Um, so uh, this book is the outgrowth of uh, many years of work with Eric Posner, who's my uh, most common co-author at this point. And if you do buy a copy of the book afterwards, make sure that they scan it on the front because uh, that actually is the barcode for the book. Um, so uh, the book, uh, because you know so many years went into it, is full of quite detailed, technical, specific policy proposals. Um, but I think that before diving into those, which I will do a little bit um, during the presentation, I want to sort of orient you to the broad um, perspective of the book, which I think is most easily done by, for a moment, suspending your practical concerns and coming with me on a journey of imagination to a fictitious uh, city that I'm going to call Marketopia. So Marketopia is a little bit like Zootopia, except rather than being defined by being inhabited by a variety of mammals, uh, its defining characteristic is that all private property, let's put aside personal effects like you know, cats and dogs and jewelry and so forth, um, but all major private property, houses, land, air, airplanes, etc., is continually up for auction to the highest bidder. Um, with the current highest bidder, the current possessor of those assets, paying that bid as a rental payment into a common pool. Um, but anyone else can come along at any time and beat that highest price and come to possess that asset. Now, in Marketopia, this principle applies not only to private property, it also applies to many things that we would usually think of as public goods, like the nature of the bus system, uh, which politicians administer various things in Marketopia, um, how the schools are run, except that rather than um, using a standard auction where the highest bidder wins exclusively, we add up the willingness of everyone to pay and, out and make the decision uh, which has the greatest total uh, willingness to pay for it. And all the proceeds of this auction are continually returned to the general public um, in equal shares as a social dividend uh, or some people might call it a universal basic income, much the way that in countries like Norway or in even Alaska, the proceeds of oil sales are continually returned to the public as a dividend. Now, um, when you think of Marketopia, your first reaction is probably that this is the most extreme version of a free market you can possibly imagine. And in fact, it makes you realize that most of our society, which we think of as a free market society, is not in fact a free market society. In fact, most assets are not liquidly available for new uses. Most of the grounds of Brown University, for example, if you wanted to repurpose it in some way, you'd have to enter into an endless, probably impossible negotiation with Brown University. And at best, you would have to pay them many multiples of what they'd be willing to accept for that piece of land because they um, you know, uh, would try to take advantage of the market power that they have over you, that you're the only, uh, they're the only people that you could bargain with for access to that asset. Um, whereas in Marketopia, because everything is continually up for a competitive bidding process, 
every asset is truly uh, competitive and contestable at every moment. Um, yet, while that sounds kind of intriguing on the one hand, it probably also sounds problematic because you might think to yourself, well, if everything is continually up for auction, won't the rich dominate everything? Won't they just outbid everybody else for control of those assets? But then you have to ask yourself, what do you mean by the rich? What do you mean by the wealthy? Well, literally, wealthy means those who have wealth. And in Marketopia, there's no such thing as private wealth. In fact, all assets are commonly owned, both in the sense that anyone can equally contest for control of those assets, and in the sense that all the benefits of the assets equally flow to all members of society. In fact, Marketopia is, in some sense, a far more thoroughgoing and consistent implementation of the principle of common ownership advocated by people like Karl Marx than real world forms of socialism, which ultimately degenerated into the control of a bureaucratic elite that turned out to be in many ways as oppressive as the capitalists that they claimed to replace um, were. So that's a paradox, or it might appear. Uh, the most extreme form of a free market is somehow the most thoroughgoing implementation of the principle of common ownership of capital. Well, that might seem a paradox today for those of us who live after the Cold War and the way that it shaped our political thought, but it would not be a uh, paradox, uh, or in fact, it would be an obvious, uh, perhaps even dogmatic tenet for uh, many of the leaders of the field of political economy in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, especially epitomized by uh, this gentleman here. So uh, does anyone know who this uh, gentleman is? Uh, I'll put aside uh, Dan and John, who've, uh, uh, but people who have not just been reading the book. Uh, does anyone know who this gentleman is? No? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's oh, that's a good, good try. And he was very good friends with Valras, but this is not Valras, no. So this guy was the best-selling author in the English language other than the Bible for 30 years. He, um, he uh, ins helped inspire the Chinese Nationalist Revolution. He was one of the greatest influences on the leading politicians in Western Europe in the early part of the 20th century. His name is Henry George. And uh, despite his enormous influence, despite his book being the namesake of the US progressive movement. Uh, Henry George's uh, ideas were largely forgotten, and his face apparently also was largely forgotten in the debates between capitalism and socialism and communism during uh, the 20th century after the Cold War, which left little room for his perspective. The goal of this talk, the goal of this book, is to dig back in, revive those ideas, argue that, in fact, the field of mechanism design for which several Nobel Prizes have been given is actually the continuation of Henry George's ideas, and to argue that together the, this vision offers an alternative to the reactionary populism of both the right and the left that um, seems to be the uh, answer to the rising uh, crisis of confidence in liberal institutions today. So what is that crisis of confidence? Well, we, we see it as having really three components. So first of all, there's been a dramatic increase in inequality uh, within uh, wealthy countries, especially Anglo-Saxon countries, over the last several decades. So on the left here, you'll see that um, uh, this comes from Piketty and Saez, the share of income accruing to the top 1% and top 0.1% of the income distribution in the United States has nearly doubled um, from the uh, uh, mid-1970s until uh, today. And um, at the same time, as we see on the right in the orange, the share of income 
accruing to all, uh, sorry, in the purple, the share of income accruing to all workers as opposed to the owners of wealth has fallen by about 10% over that period. Now, that might not worry you if you thought, sort of as Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher argued, that you know, that sort of inequality is just the cost of a more dynamic, more quickly growing, more competitive economy, and we just have to accept that sort of uh, increasing channeling of uh, returns to wealth rather than to labor in order to have that sort of uh, growth and uh, technological progress. But at the same time that we've seen this declining return to work, we've also seen a dramatic increase in market power among firms. So uh, the way that I've plotted that here is that this orange line is uh, the inverse of the average markup of firms in the economy according to uh, recent analysis by ECUT and um, DeLoker. And uh, what you see is just as labor income has been uh, uh, falling, the share of uh, markups has almost tripled during the same periods. And if, as this suggests, a lot of this increase in inequality is not due to dynamism, is not due to greater competition, but in fact to precisely the opposite, to an increase in rents, an increase in market power in the economy, you would expect to see the economy slowing down at precisely the same time that um, this inequality has been growing, and that in fact is exactly what you see. So throughout the wealthy world, you've seen growth rates fall um, from the rates that prevailed in the post-war period to the last 30 years in half in the United States, but even more dramatically in Europe. In the United Kingdom, for example, uh, uh, rates of growth are about one-tenth what they were uh, in that previous period. And in France, uh, the fall has been even more dramatic. Um, so this combination of stagnation and inequality what we call uh, uh, stagnant quality uh, is, um, I think, discrediting existing economic, um, uh, economic wisdom in this era in the same way that stagflation in the 1970s, the combination of stagnation and inflation, discredited the standard Keynesian worldview in the um, 1970s. Uh, uh, um, and this undermining of uh, belief in the standard economic paradigm in neoliberal ideas in particular um, has been fueling a backlash that's seeking alternative approaches uh, to uh, the economy. And um, it's not only a purely economic uh, concern, however, because uh, the dissatisfaction with existing uh, paradigms, I don't think, is purely economic. There's also an increasing concern about the ability of democratic governance to legitimately resolve the tensions between minorities and majorities within wealthy countries. And that's on both sides of the political spectrum. So it's both um, concerns among gun owners about uh, their status of minority and, and, and uh, them calling upon courts to protect their interests, and the um, ways in which a variety of ethno-racial and uh, immigrant minorities uh, within both the United States and Europe have increasingly looked to both the judicial system and, uh, in the case of Europe, to transnational institutions with less democratic accountability to protect them against the oppression of majorities. Um, so increasingly, both the economic wisdom, the economic technocrats that we rely on to steer the economy, and the political technocrats, the judges, uh, and the supranational institutions that resolve the tensions between tyranny of the majority and the rights of minorities seem to have be, be becoming increasingly illegitimate. And um, in reaction to this, we see an increasing turn to reactionary populist ideologies, both of the right as shown here by Brexit and uh, Donald Trump, 
and of the left, as we see with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn and sort of old guard state socialism in um, the United Kingdom. So uh, our view is that in this time of crisis, we need to open our minds to alternative political conceptions that have sufficient boldness and, um, and promise to offer an alternative to these reactionary ideologies, which we do not believe can actually address the underlying issues of inequality, slow growth, uh, and political conflict. And so what I'm going to do today is start by laying out uh, the proposal, which is in chapter one of our book, which is not necessarily the most important one in the book, but the one that I think most clearly breaks apart our standard left-right political discourse and most clearly offers us an alternative basis for a political vision. And then I'll briefly talk about the other proposals, try to tie those together into something of a broader social vision, and uh, briefly talk about uh, w what we might do to move forward from these ideas. Okay. So the standard discourse that uh, the 20th century has led us to think about is the conflict between um, capitalism on the one hand, uh, often dominated by um, corporations and uh, private property and so forth, and on the other hand, centralized planning uh, or state socialism uh, on the other hand. But, um, <laughs> In the um, late 19th century, there was a, a very important movement in economics which viewed both of these as unacceptably centralized systems of power because, uh, uh, as many of these thinkers uh, argued, capitalism tended towards monopoly both in the ownership of land and the ownership of property that kept land from being used in its best uh, uses and in the concentrated control of business enterprises, which were bureaucratic and stopped uh, the free flow of markets. Um, and on the other hand, state socialism, which actually just embraced precisely that monopolistic tendency of markets and made it central to the organization of society. Instead, these thinkers argued that to have truly competitive markets, we had to move beyond private property and its tendency towards monopoly. And uh, the central uh, thinker in this, uh, or the most famous thinker in this movement was Henry George. So Henry George argued that um, uh, land, uh, the land on which all of uh, uh, civilization is built, is created by God. It's not created by any person. And so it can't belong to any person. And in fact, all of the value uh, of the land comes from the general progress of civilization around uh, uh, the land. He has a story of someone who arrives in an infinite savanna with uh, beautiful natural endowments everywhere and settles down in one spot, taking a thousand acres for himself. But um, while he has all the affordances of nature, uh, he has no one to trade with, he has no one to help him in his tasks. And so the next person who comes along settles on a less nice piece of land next to him. And pretty soon a city grows up. And after a few years, he's the richest man in the society for having done nothing except having arrived and taken a bunch of land and appropriated it from the public uh, for his private use. And uh, so George advocated for solving this problem by having 100% tax on the value of land, on the rents from land, and no tax at all on anything else. So no tax on labor, no tax on capital. So we made a very sharp distinction between the natural endowments of the earth on the one hand and human creations, labor and capital on the other hand. So um, George was enormously influential. Albert Einstein referred to him as the greatest thinker of the 19th century, greater than uh, Maxwell, who was his uh, favorite physicist. Um, uh, John Dewey uh, said that he was the most important influence on the progressive movement. Um, but, uh, uh, and uh, he also was reflected in popular culture in some very interesting ways. So this shows a billboard that someone put up on a vacant lot in New York City. It reads, everybody works but the vacant lot. 
I paid 3,600 for this lot and will hold it till I get 6,000. The profit is un an unearned increment uh, made possible by the presence of this community and the enterprise of its people. I take the profit without earning it. For the remedy, read Henry George. Henry George also inspired one of the most important pop cultural uh, artifacts of the 20th century, which is this. Does anyone recognize what this is? Yeah, so this, this became Monopoly, but it's actually uh, was called the Landlord's Game originally. It was invented by Elizabeth Meiji, um, and it had two sets of rules. One set of rules, set of rules were the Monopoly rules, and the other set of rules were the progressive or Georgist rules. So under um, the Monopoly rules, the game plays roughly like what you're used to. But under the Georgist set of rules, um, the land rents on each of these areas, though not the house rents, accrue to the public treasury, which then uses them first to buy out the utilities so that they're available for free, then to buy out the railroads so they're available for free, and then eventually the money is used to pay a social dividend that you receive when you pass this spot, which is now known as Go. Um, so the point of the game was originally to teach people that under capitalism, uh, everything tends towards monopoly and the one person dominating everything and driving everyone else out, whereas under a just set of property rules and so forth, instead you would have uh, the impossibility of anyone dominating it and everybody uh, prospering together as each did better. Um, so uh, Henry George was enormously influential, but there were some, I think, uh, important weaknesses in his ideas that while uh, his vision inspired so many, led his actual proposals not to be widely adopted. So, uh, probably the most important of these is that George made this very sharp distinction between land and labor. But if you think about it, almost everything that is useful that we have is actually some combination of these. Consider a gold mine. Imagine you had 100% tax on the value of the gold mine. But anything that was taken out of the gold mine would become capital and would be taxed at a 0% rate. Now imagine you got possession of that gold mine. What would you do? Well, obviously, the first thing you would do is immediately grab all the gold out of it as quickly as you can and put it in your house and then say, OK, now this is my capital. All of it completely belongs to me. And this thing that gets taxed at 100% is this useless, uh, hollowed out gold mine. And of course, that would happen for all other natural resources. In fact, Georgism would have been literally an environmental disaster because people would have had an incentive to strip all assets out from nature as quickly as possible. Um, and conversely, even trying to figure out um, precisely what the contributions were of the structures on top of land versus the land underneath it is a fiendishly difficult uh, problem to actually try to undertake. Now, that didn't mean that people didn't try to apply George's ideas, and they came up with very creative ways of trying to think about this. So one of the people most inspired by um, uh, George was this gentleman. Does anyone recognize him? Sun Yat-sen, exactly. So this was Sun Yat-sen, who was uh, the leader of the nationalist revolution against uh, the Qin dynasty in China. And he uh, described his relationship to George as analogous to that that Lenin had to um, Marx. And he said that uh, George's ideas would be the basis of his uh, revolution. Now, unfortunately, uh, uh, I think for the history of the 20th century, Sun didn't manage to keep control of China once he freed it of the Qin dynasty, unlike the Bolsheviks in um, Russia. And so eventually his ideas were sort of buried in the uh, arrival of communism to China. But he had, came up with an extremely creative way of implementing uh, George's ideas, which is that everyone would assess the value of their own property. They would pay a tax on that self-assessed value. But then the government could always come and buy the property from you at that value if it thought that you were undervaluing it. So that was a very creative way to get people to reveal the value of the land. 
Um, but unfortunately, when this was eventually implemented in Chiang Kai-shek, who was the nationalist successor to Sun's uh, a government in Taiwan, where the nationalist forces retreated uh, uh, to escape the communists, the government officials were often quite corrupt and would not actually take the land, even if it was dramatically undervalued. So this system didn't work. Now, I, I think unaware of this, Arnold Harberger, a University of Chicago economist and the founder of the so-called uh, Chicago Boys, who um, uh, famously advised uh, the uh, uh, dictator of uh, Chile, um, Augusto Pinochet, um, when he was first doing work in Chile in the early 1960s, he proposed a system of property taxes that he thought would be much easier to enforce uh, given the conditions of corruption there than uh, the assessment system that they were using. And it was very related to this idea. So um, this, I'll, I'll let Harberger describe directly to you the ideas, uh, which we revived uh, along with Anthony Zhang, who uh, is a graduate student at Stanford GSB as the common ownership self-assessed tax. So he says, if you have to make a base for taxes, adopt criteria that determine the true economic value. The solution that the economist offers is simple and direct. Allow the owner to declare the value himself, make the values public, and oblige the owner to sell his property to any person willing to, um, willing to pay the declared value. The si system is simple and creates incentives, even beyond those existing in the market, for assets to be employed in their most productive economic use. OK, so what would this actually mean in practice if we were to implement this system? So first of all, we would allow every possessor of assets who pays this tax to choose how to bundle their assets. So if you, say, bought up a whole bunch of houses and wanted to make it into a condominium, you could immediately bundle those together and say, no, this is a condominium, not uh, uh, a um, series of houses. And so you have to buy the whole thing uh, rather than buying them separately. People would have uh, a specified period in which they could um, vacate their homes. So um, just like there's eviction proceedings, just like there are um, foreclosure proceedings, there would be some process for uh, uh, leaving a house if, if it got purchased. Third, if someone wanted to inspect a property to figure out its value, they could freeze the price pay some fee for inspection, and uh, look at it uh, before deciding to uh, buy it. Um, the optimal rate of this tax is ideally not uniform across different assets. It should actually be calibrated to uh, a couple of things, the most important of which is the turnover rate of assets. So assets like uh, personal effects, which maybe you would even exempt entirely from this, that very rarely turn over and that are held on to someone for their whole lifetime, uh, this should be taxed at an incredibly low rate. On the other hand, assets that turn over much more frequently, like Spectrum or like um, uh, maybe a car that's, that gets sold as used cars quite re with reasonable frequency, business assets, these things should be taxed at a higher rate. The rate should roughly be proportioned to the turnover rate of that asset. That's what offsets the incentive to set an exaggerated price. But also, it, assets that require a lot of care and investment should be taxed at a lower rate than assets that uh, are, are more like George's land, invariant to the investment that people make in them. Um, liabilities uh, and mortgages would be deductible from the assets, so the tax would be paid on the net amount of ownership. Um, technology would play a really important role uh, both in helping you browse the set of assets that are available and decide what it is that you would want to buy, for example, but also in helping people as assess what value they might want to set for the asset and taking into account all the relevant contingencies. Overall in the economy, though, we think that something like a 7% rate on average is likely to be close to optimal which would expropriate roughly two-thirds of private wealth uh, once you take into account the full discounted value of all those payments that you'd have to make. Now, what, what, are, what are the benefits of this? Well, um, as I mentioned, 
there is this uh, view in the 19th century. Sorry, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. If everyone bids against you, then you say, okay, well, I'll buy it off them immediately afterwards, and then pay them the high price when they're willing to pay the high price. So why, why do you, what, how, does, how is this incentive compatible in some ways? So, uh, I mean, someone could buy it off of you. And then I just buy it straight back. Like, and now I'm willing to pay the market price. Well, I mean, they, they have to choose what they assess it at, so you'd be hoping that they don't assess it at... Sure, but then, you know, then I'm only willing to pay the, the market price when, you know, someone's bidding against it. Well, so, so first of all, the main goal of this is to achieve efficiency. And so if, uh, you know, I mean, there might be exceptional cases where something like that might occur, but the primary goal of this is not to raise revenue. The primary goal of this is to achieve efficiency. But, um, but second of all, the, you know, what you're describing is not the optimal strategy, uh, you know, because you'll, if the tax rate is set near the turnover rate, then the chance that the asset's going to be taken from you exactly offsets the marginal additional tax that you pay. So unless the tax rate is set well above the turnover rate, um, there, you never have an incentive to do what you're describing. But I mean, I guess it's, it's this sort of, but it, it depends on the cost of turnover, I guess. I mean, if, if I have to sell this good and buy it back again, if that imposes... No, no, even, even if there's no cost associated with that, still, the, the t if the tax rate is set equal to the turnover rate for the asset, now, whether you can achieve that exactly for everything is another question, but supposing that it's actually set that way, then any benefit you get from reducing the price is exactly compensated by a reduction in the amount that you get at the moment of purchase. Okay, so I'm thinking about this in terms of some discrete goods like houses, but okay. Uh, yeah. If when you're, you're bidding with continuous quantities, I can see that that's true. No, 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 I'm talking about discrete goods. So, uh, I'm, talking, I'm talking turnover rate, I mean the probability of turnover. Okay. The percent chance of turnover. And at any time, anyone can come and buy it. And the tax rate is set at the percent chance per year that it turns over. But I, don't see, I don't see why I can't make an instantaneous sort of change of my valuation. So you buy it from me and I instantly come, come back and say... I'm I can come back, but I would lose money in the process. I would receive for it less than I would have to buy it back from you. So what, what, what are the benefits of this? What, what are the, you know, how, what, what does it improve? Well, I, I referred to this general notion that private property is this monopolistic quality where things don't get turned over to their best uses, but someone holds on to it. Now, that was a very broad, vague idea in the 19th century. Uh, Leon Valras, who uh, the gentleman here mentioned, talked a lot about this idea, but he didn't specify exactly why that would happen. Let me describe some reasons that economists during the 20th century have figured out uh, uh, that happened. So one reason is what's called the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem. So this is the notion that if um, I have an asset and you might, uh, Dan might be the better owner of that asset, if he comes and tries to make me an offer to purchase this asset, he's probably not going to offer me the full amount that he'd be willing to pay because he wants to try to make some profit. On the other hand, I'm not going to be willing to sell it at exactly what I'd be willing to accept because I'm going to try to get him to pay a higher price for it. Unless we have full knowledge for certain that he values it more than I do, and we both are 100% sure of that, there's a theorem which says that there's no way for us to consistently transfer the asset from me to him. But that's not the only reason that uh, private property tends to inhibit trade. There's a whole bunch of other reasons that we've also learned. So, for example, um, I might exaggerate the value of the asset, not just in order to try to get more off Dan, but to try to convince him that he should value it more. Because he might look to the price that I charge as an indication of how much it's really worth. And so I have an incentive to exaggerate upward the price to persuade him that it's really a good asset. 
Um, both of these effects, I think, are reflected in a heuristic that a lot of people use, which is called the endowment effect, which is if I own something, I'm always going to be asking more for it than I'd be willing to pay in order to get it. And I think that's a psychological trick that many of us use to deal with both of these bargaining problems. And in fact, there's increasing evidence that that's the case. And when people are renters, they don't have that attachment. They don't have this sort of irrational psychological uh, uh, reaction that they should be willing to pay more to keep things than they are willing to pay to get them in the first place. So if we had a more uh, a system where people weren't f fully owners, where they were paying this tax, I think that would erode this sense of irrational attachment in, uh, uh, embodied in the endowment effect. Third, and I think uh, equally importantly, um, a huge source of the monopoly problem in capitalism is that new entrants, new firms, find it very hard to raise the credit, raise the money that they need in order to potentially compete and to buy the assets necessary to compete. In this economy, all assets would fall, immediately their value would fall by two thirds because you would be taking into account all the taxes that you have to pay in the future. So it would become far easier to buy assets in the first place. Effectively, the down payment on an asset would be like the full value of it because it would take into account all those taxes that you would eventually pay. And fourth, this would raise a huge amount of money that could be used to equalize society and therefore give people, many more people, the access to competing uh, for assets. So uh, let me give you an illustrative calculation of this. So a US median household has roughly $60,000 of equity in their house and $25,000 of other assets. On the other hand, the average amount of capital in the economy per four people is $960,000. So um, if these both fell in you know, to one third of their current value because of the tax, um, the uh, equity of a typical household would fall to $20,000, whereas uh, the average equity in the economy would fall to $320,000. A 7% tax on that would be that a family, a typical family of four, would have to pay about $1,000.5 a year to maintain their assets and not have them be taken, but um, they would receive a social dividend from this money of about $22,500. Um, and uh, th that would lead to a net gain of roughly $21,000 for every family uh, of four. Now, those families of four, you might say, look, they don't want to lose their house. They love living in their house. They want more stability in their life. Let's imagine that they overvalued their house by a factor of five. So nobody would want to take their house. Still, they would on net in this system be gaining about $14,000 uh, for the family. So, and if everyone else was overvaluing their assets, they would be getting even more of a dividend back in exchange for that. So under this system, just like at present, stability is costly. The rich in our society, they don't get evicted from their houses. They don't get foreclosed upon. They don't live in dangerous places where their house is likely to get destroyed. Um, the poor do in our society. They have instability. They have to deal with all of those problems. In this society, too, you can pay for stability. However, in this society, the means to pay for stability are far more equally distributed among people. And if you impose costs by insisting on stability, by insisting on a monopoly price for your house, you have to pay for that in society so that everyone would have more opportunities because uh, so many more assets would be contestable. Overall, this would reduce inequality back to the levels that it reached uh, in the mid-1970s, sorry, half of the way to the levels that it reached at the trough of inequality in the mid-1970s, quite close to the levels of inequality that prevail in uh, Sweden at present. And at the same time, it would generate enough revenue to eliminate all other taxes on capital and pay down most of the national debt uh, uh, while still providing this income. 
Okay, now that may sound like a crazy, total upending of society that never has any chance of happening. And uh, I would disagree that it never has any chance of happening, but it certainly is quite radical. But in the near term, we can make some significant steps in this direction that are not particularly controversial, that will allow us to experiment with these mechanisms, and that will bring tangible gains immediately. And one of these we proposed with Paul Milgram, uh, who's a Stanford professor who uh, uh, was central to the design of the um, uh, spectrum auctions. And, um, he uh, recently designed a set of auctions that were, that were meant to reallocate spectrum from old uses like uh, television broadcast to newer uses like 5G and Wi-Fi. And that took the government seven years in an incredibly costly, complex, bureaucratic auction to make that happen. But Milgram, in this piece with us, argued if instead the government, rather than having these perpetual licenses, had a license where you continually had to assess a price and be ready to sell at that price, then you would um, constantly have the ability to reallocate that spectrum to its most efficient economic use. And so we proposed that to the FCC in a journal called Regulation, and uh, there's been uh, significant discussion at the FCC, and we're also talking in the United Kingdom to the um, uh, authority that manages oil drilling rights about a similar system. And um, I think actually the nearest term thing that's likely to happen is that within the blockchain community, there's an increasing interest in ideas like this. And uh, I was just talking to Vitalik Buterin, who's the uh, basically leader of the Ethereum community, about using this for internet uh, addresses within blockchain, within the Ethereum community. Uh, that may actually well happen within the next couple of months. So, um, those are three somewhat scattered examples, but if you think about all the examples like this, things like intellectual property, all the administrative uh, leases and so forth that the uh, federal government does, et cetera, that accounts for something like 15 to 20% of the total capital in the economy. So already you could make some non-trivial progress towards this world and certainly learn a tremendous amount about how this all works with these relatively uncontroversial applications. But in the long term, I do think that it should be applied very broadly. And that might sound challenging. It might sound crazy that, you know, um, maybe even my personal problem, my car would be up for the auction like this. But I actually think that the social effects of this are actually quite desirable. Because if you think about the longest, you know, sharpest critiques of capitalism, some of the most important ones are precisely its tendency to foster an excessive attachment to material possessions. And um, that attachment to material possessions, rather than to the people around us, rather than our, to our communities, would be eroded if we came to view many of the things that we own as a little bit more like a spot on the beach, which we inhabit at the moment, but which will pass on to someone else at someone, some other moment. And on the other hand, view other people's property as rather than something totally divorced from us that we could never have, instead as something that we might take advantage of at some other point in the future, if that's advantageous to us. If we come to have a society, which I think we're already coming to have to some extent, where uses and opportunities and experiences are valued more than permanent possessions that we hold on to forever, um, not that there isn't some value to attachment to things, but here we would have an optimal degree of attachment to things, which balances the ability of others to potentially use those better in the future with uh, our ability to form attachments and uh, get value out of them. And um, at the same time, I think even beyond its effects on our attachment to possessions versus to our communities, I also think that um, in many ways, uh, this world would create a much more just society and would ameliorate many of the complaints that people have made about the sort of moral culture that's engendered by capitalism. So the, the defenders of capitalism have long claimed that a competitive market creates a scenario where we all mutually benefit from each other's prosperity and therefore tends to create camaraderie and to break down the sense of violence that exists within feudalism. 
But of course, that's true of competition, perfect competition. It's not true of monopoly. A monopolist is precisely the opposite. A monopolist takes advantage of everyone that they interact with and views every interaction as a chance to exploit and to extract as much rent as possible from the person that they're facing. And I think the problem is, in capitalism, we only get competition in impersonal markets with very large numbers of actors. So our personal lives and our interaction with the market in our personal lives all feel more, much more like monopoly and exploitation. That's why we dread interacting commercially with people who might be our friends, because we're so worried about having to be placed in this position of trying to take advantage of each other. But um, in this society, that's not how things would work because the mechanism itself would create a sense of perfect competition. We would effectively act as price takers. We would not worry about a negotiation with someone. We would set a price, and for the reasons I was describing before, that price would always be something that we would be willing <coughs> to accept for the asset. So we would benefit any time someone came along and took something. But rather than having a long, drawn-out negotiation that was a headache for everyone, instead it would just be a natural beneficial transaction the same way that our anonymous transactions in large scale markets are mutually beneficial uh, transactions. And at the same time, because our social dividend would be a share of all the value created within the communities in which we live, because we would have that value constantly returned to us, the same way that within, say, Microsoft, the corporation I work for, I have a share of the profits of Microsoft Corporation because I'm required to hold stock, I think that people, would, it would foster a sense of everyone diffusely benefiting from the value created by the community, fostering trust and solidarity and so forth. Okay, so that's the first idea uh, in the book. Let me tell you about the other f uh, four very quickly. Um, yeah, go ahead. How do companies work in this world? So, like, yeah. so companies are possessors in this world. So just like in, in our present world, they're people, effectively. But they have liabilities as well, which is the shares in those companies. And those liabilities uh, would be self-assessed in the same way that the assets are self-assessed. So effectively, the possessors of the shares in the companies would assess the value of those shares, those would be a liability that would be written down against the assets that the company holds. And the company could choose how it wants to package those. So if it thought, say, that the company is just going to sell as a whole or not sell it at all, not, it doesn't want anything else to be for sale, it could package everything for the company together. That would be very expensive for it to do because it would just pay taxes on everything. But it, to the extent that it thought that it could get a lower tax liability or was willing to sell those assets, it could debundle them and therefore reduce the amount that it has to pay in taxes. Okay, so the second idea is to um, have a system of collective decision making which truly achieves the greatest good for the greatest number rather than uh, the tyranny of the majority by allowing people to choose how much influence they want to exert on different issues and different uh, elections um, based on allocating some budget that they're given. Except that there's a specific rule in this world, namely that you pay the square of the amount of influence you have on any given issue out of your budget of voice credits. So this is called quadratic voting, and um, it's the unique uh, a system of vote pricing in this way that gives um, an incentive for everyone to vote in proportion to how important the issues are to them. And while if it sounds a little bit mathematically abstruse, you can make it very easy and concrete for people to interact with uh, using a little bit of software. So here is a survey that we ran uh, nationally on a variety of hot button issues. And if you get one vote on any of these issues, it just costs you one credit. But as you have more votes on an issue, you see that the cost becomes increasingly large for an additional vote. So using that technology, we've gotten um, uh, people who haven't even completed college or even high school 
uh, to pretty reliably report intensities of preferences to us uh, um, using this system. And we think more broadly that it could create a true market system for collective decision making uh, in a wide range of areas and address many of the crises of uh, majority minority conflict. Um, third, uh, we propose a system that we call the Visa Between Individuals Program, where rather than large corporations or um, uh, uh, governments being those who decide who is able to migrate to the country, every citizen would have a right to sponsor migrants and to negotiate with them subject to some uh, labor protections for a share of the surplus that the migrant gets from uh, coming to the country so that every citizen would benefit from migration. And therefore, uh, there would be an interest among uh, uh, the general public strongly for their own economic uh, benefit in supporting migration rather than just among capitalists and those living in cosmopolitan cities, allowing for a much greater degree of migration. Uh, fourth, we argue that uh, antitrust laws have a tremendous amount of potential that has not been tapped because the overwhelming sources of market power in our society are not even uh, investigated by existing antitrust authorities. Those are, first, um, that there's far greater market power over workers than there is over consumers. And the way to think about that intuitively is in, think about a typical product that you buy, like a water bottle. How many reasonable options do you have that you would be like pretty close to indifferent between for buying reasonably good water bottles? Probably five, 10, et cetera. How many options do you have for your job that you would be reasonably indifferent and that if you say your wages went down by 5%, you would quit and move to the other job? I think there's basically one maybe for some of us, maybe for some of us none. So uh, there's far greater market power in, product, in, in labor markets than in product markets, and yet there's never been a single antitrust case uh, that blocked a merger because of the effects that it has on labor markets, even though all the time mergers affect the structure of labor market competition. So there, I would say that's like two thirds of all market power completely been exempted effectively from antitrust analysis. At the same time, probably the most important source of that market power has been completely ignored by antitrust officials, which is the power of large investors like State Street, BlackRock, Vanguard. They, can, they own roughly a third of the corporate economy, and they're the largest shareholders, the five largest shareholders of the vast majority of companies in the corporate economy. And yet, and so they have no interest in seeing United compete with American or uh, Delta, or CVS compete with Walgreens. There, there's no benefit to them of such competition. And there's increasing evidence showing that that lack of competition is raising prices and reducing investment. And yet there's been no attempt, even though there are very simple ways that you could address that, to reduce the power of those investors to uh, eliminate competition in our economy. And finally, um, we argue that all of the contributions that each of us makes through the data that we provide to digital services um, is the fuel that allows AI services to eventually so supposedly displace our jobs. And yet we're not paid for any of that work that we're doing. Effectively, AI systems that are gonna eliminate our jobs are just broadcasting all of the information that we have fed into them. And yet we're not compensated uh, for that because of the monopsony power of the largest data platforms. And we argue for a modern data labor movement which would uh, create power among uh, those supplying data to demand treatment uh, as uh, for their labor uh, as workers. Okay, altogether we argue that these ideas would um, grow the economy by roughly a third while reducing near permanently, as long as you think that capital is the leading source of uh, inequality, near permanently reducing inequality to levels mid-century or below. They, they would therefore double the median income while only reducing the income of the top 1% by about a quarter, or the effective income equivalents. And at the same time, beyond their purely economic effects, 
I think as, at a societal level, they would increasingly reconcile people who feel left behind by markets and technological change to that change and, in fact, show them the benefits of it. It would show them the opportunity created by digital technology, the opportunity created by immigration, the opportunity created by markets in assets, rather than reserving that for the wealthy and elites in big cities. And at the same time, it would heal the divides between the rich and the poor world and between minorities and majorities within wealthy countries, rather than continuing to fissure those divides as so many of the reactionary uh, uh, policies that are prescribed as alternatives can. So these are radical ideas, but I do believe that they're feasible ideas. I believe they're ideas like the neoliberal ideas of uh, Milton Friedman in the you know, early 1960s, uh, whatever you think of those, which might seem crazy at first, but, uh, but sh are such a clear path of potential solutions to the problems that we're facing that they'll eventually, in some form, have to be a part of our discourse. And maybe eventually they'll become uh, inevitable in the way that his ideas uh, uh, did. So um, the, uh, and yet the things I've described are not really the end point. In fact, I set up my ideas in a very specific way. I wanted them each to individually be attractive and feasible proposals. But if you put them all together, there's all sorts of additional possibilities that emerge. And I won't go into that too much, but for example, Quadratic voting I described as a system based on this artificial currency that everyone would get. But if we had a much more equal society, we could actually base it directly on money um, in a way that would be much less problematic and that would bring additional gains because people who overall care more about the public sphere would be able to express themselves more and probably represent the interests of their uh, compatriots uh, better. Okay. So um, I am under no illusions that these ideas are going to be easily intelligible or communicable to a very, very broad audience. Um, I'm trying to put something out there that can inspire, especially young people I've seen uh, have reacted uh, very, uh, in a very engaged way to this, to um, build upon them uh, and help communicate um, and inspire uh, more people to be able to interact with these. And so I hope that uh, scholars and entrepreneurs and artists and leaders and activists and all sorts of people will take something away from this, build upon it, uh, and help bring, I think, uh, ideas that we desperately need to um, uh, a broader uh, audience. So thanks so much, and I'm excited to take your questions. Oh, that was fascinating, and I, I'm Steve Calabresi. For those who in the room who haven't met me, I teach at Northwestern Law School in Chicago, but happen to be in Providence most of the year. Um, I, I would yield to no one in my libertarianism yeah. or in my willingness to redistribute wealth beyond yeah. the point that it has been redistributed up to now. I think, for example, that eliminating zoning laws and allowing the building of apartment buildings in suburbs would desegregate our neighborhoods and schools very quickly by eliminating government interference. I think that one of the key problems we face with the health care situation is that uh, health insurance is regulated at the state level and there is an interstate competition yeah. among health insurers. So I yield to no one in my yeah. libertarianism. As to redistribution, I would support a 2% tax on assets or capital yeah. per year. Yeah. But I have uh, at least three major problems with the proposal you've put yeah. forward. The first problem is that I've always believed that stability in our Constitution, which has lasted 225 years, and stability generally um, reduces the risk factor in investment. And investors who are making investments looking to the long term, like paying out 20 years from now, uh, want to be sure that they're going to be able to realize the benefit on those investments, or they simply won't make them. And by eliminating the stability <coughs> of property rights, you make everything completely transferable, and I wonder whether the risk factor to investment doesn't become very high. 
And one way I would illustrate this is by immediately asking you after I'm done with my question how much you value your co-authorship of this book yep. and what you would be willing to sell it to me for yep. if I decided I was enamored with these ideas and wanted to be associated with the yep. fame and glory that you've yep. created by writing the book. So the first thing is the risk factor and in investment. Yep. The second thing which you talked about is that can, you Can said, I answer them sequentially so I don't forget them because they don't sure. actually have something to write down on? Sure. So you're absolutely right about the investment thing. And in fact, the book goes in detail into the trade-off between investment efficiency and, uh, and allocative efficiency. And there is 100% a trade-off between those two things. However, um, first of all, we would use half of the uh, income that we raise off this to eliminate other capital taxes. Other capital taxes and some income taxes and pay down debt. All of those things weigh in precisely the same way on investment but they don't have the efficiency benefits that this has. So eliminating those is just pure efficiency gain. And then we would, on addition to, in addition to that, raise a bit more revenue. Now, 7% sounds a lot more than mm -hmm. 2%, but it's not as much more as it sounds. And the reason is that once you eliminate all that other stuff and um, you think about the compounding of that, the marginal tax of that additional tax rate is much less because it's falling on a reduced base than the initial part of it is. So effectively, my 7% tax is really your 2% tax on the margin mm -hmm. because it, you go in and eliminate all those other taxes at the same time. So, so I, think, I think it's very consistent with that. And it, it has the efficiency benefit. But, but overall, mm -hmm. that 7% rate is a trade-off between the investment and, sure. the, and the allocated efficiency. Sure. Absolutely, you're right sure. that the investment efficiency is a cost of this proposal, uh -huh. and you have to trade that off against the. And, and yeah. what is the price at which you would sell your co-authorship of the book to me at, right now? Um, well, currently, we don't have a tax on that. <laughs> so I have, would have an incentive to set a very high uh, value for that. So if I'm optimizing I'm in my world, I would, uh, I would set a price of, I, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, 30, 40 million dollars. Okay. But, but if you taxed me on it uh, at the optimal turnover rate of intellectual property assets, which might well be six or seven percent, <laughs> I might give you a different reaction. So that leads me to my second question, which is the endowment effect, which you talked about. And the endowment yeah. effect is real. I mean, yeah. if it's been shown in experiments with college and law students that if you give them a free mug right. and tell them it's theirs <coughs> and the mug is worth five dollars, when you go to buy it for, from them, they'll pay, they'll want ten or fifteen dollars right. for the Absolutely. mug rather than the five dollars it was worth. I mean, the yeah. endowment effect is real and I have to mention to you, I recently celebrated my 60th birthday yeah. And after, at the age of 60, I have many more things I'm sentimentally attached yeah. to than you probably have at the age that you're right. currently at, which I will be polite enough yeah. not to ask you to disclose. Yeah. But, you know, sentimental, sentimental attachments to things are a real aspect of human right. behavior and a real phenomenon. And it seems to me that uh, some of that is attached to a piece of land or a house, yeah. even if it's not yeah. a particularly remarkable one. Yeah. So, so there is, uh, you're absolutely right that the endowment effect occurs, but it's also true that it occurs far less to things that we rent than that we own. And there is evidence about that as well. And there's also evidence that it happens far more in societies where bargaining is, is an issue and something people anticipate than in societies where that's not the case. And in fact, there's there's uh, a really beautiful paper in the American Economic Review that shows that that happens. So there, there's, uh, there's a tribes in East Africa called the Hadza, mm -hmm. and some of them have more exposure to trading in marketplaces than others do. And there's basically no endowment effect among people who don't have exposures to market bargaining, and there is an endowment effect among those who do have exposures to market bargaining. So I, um, I, I think that the endowment effect is an outgrowth of private property but I'm not sure it's a desirable outgrowth of private property, or at least not in the extreme form that it manifests at present. So I'm not saying that there shouldn't be some attachments that develop and so forth, but maybe they shouldn't be as strong as they are and that we, that, that we have super optimally 
uh, monopolistically strong attachments to objects. So my final comment was uh, with respect to the voting proposals yeah. and all the public choice problems yeah. that would be entailed in setting up a government that would manage the system without veering over into something more like crony capitalism. Yeah. Um, one of the huge problems that vo consumers and voters face is rational ignorance. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons why democracy doesn't always function perfectly is that voters don't have an incentive to know as much about the candidates as we might like them to yeah. have because your vote in practice doesn't make much difference. Yeah. So for example, in Illinois, I was regularly asked to vote on dozens of state judges. I'm a law professor in Chicago. Yeah. I knew nothing about these state judges. I couldn't vote in those elections. I was rationally ignorant, yeah. so I didn't vote. Most of the public is probably rationally ignorant according to opinion polls about various things. Yeah. How could you possibly make something like quadratic voting work in a world where people are rationally ignorant about scores and scores yeah. of different so, things? So I don't think we can make any system work perfectly in a world where that's true, but I don't think that's any more true less true of quadratic voting than of anything else. But I do think quadratic voting precisely for the reasons that you're describing would work far better than our present system. Let me describe why. Okay. Um, I can be perfectly arrogant, like I'm sure all of us can, about how ignorant many people are about national politics and how I should have much more votes than other people do on that. However, with regards to things like you're describing, yeah. but, but even more um, you know, local politics, who's running for school board or whatever, I am uh, a, the worst curse on democracy uh, because I am a total transient. I have no idea. I don't even know what offices are, are available in the south end of Boston. Um, but there's many people who've lived there for years and who know all about that and, and who know that that guy is the one who you know, was uh, you know, molesting the little children or you know this other one was stealing from the public trough and that's just not, I mean, there's all sorts of local knowledge that people have. And what would be far better for everyone is if we could trade, is if they could vote on the things that they know about and I could vote on the things that I know about. That's how the marketplace works. But we don't apply that principle in our collective decisions and quadratic voting precisely allows us to apply that principle. And in fact, there's a wonderful literature on what's called issue publics, where within almost every social class and every demographic group, you can find people who are incredibly knowledgeable about all the issues that we decry that social class or group not being knowledgeable about. It's just that they're always a minority of those people. Mm -hmm. But if those issues, if that class was effectively represented by the knowledgeable members of the class rather than by the ignorant members of the class, and probably those people who are ignorant on one issue, they're knowledgeable about another. If we allowed for that fluidity, if we allowed for that trade, we would have a political system that came far closer to approximating the local expertise that we rely upon in the marketplace than the ignorance that we institute as a rule through the one person, one vote uh, system in our collective decisions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for yeah. a provocative and fascinating talk. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. The, the first is that uh, you didn't say much about how you model one of the most important actors in your story, which yeah. is who's setting the tax. Yeah. And the optimal tax is crucial to the system of generating the benefits yeah. that you identify. Um, but when we look around the world today, it doesn't look like optimal taxes across assets uh, are, are, are in practice. Yeah. So what do you have to model about the sort of political and bureaucratic decision-making process, the information that they need and their incentives to use that information for, you know, to avoid capture and to set the right yeah. tax rates. Yeah. So I think one really desirable feature of this system uh, is what I sometimes refer to as proof by blockchain. So uh, I, I'm actually not necessarily a hugest fan of blockchain technology, but I think that you can investigate a system and whether it really involves discretionary, potentially arbitrary authority based on whether or not you could basically implement it in a decentralized blockchain type system or whether uh, you can't. And this system I really think you can. And the reason is that at least an approximately optimal tax rate in almost all these cases can be set 
purely on the basis of the turnover of assets. So then the only question is, which asset classes do you allow? Because then once you have an asset class, you can just say, what's the average turnover rate of that asset within the economy? And it's not just that that can be implemented in a mechanical way, it's that it's transparent. And people in the public can say, no, 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 the asset doesn't turn over that much. That's too high of a tax rate for this asset, right? And so I, because there's an empirical approximate efficient, sufficient statistic for this that is easily observable and not subject to a lot of technocratic dispute, uh, I think that you can do pretty close to making this almost literally automatic as a way of operating it. Yeah, Dan. Glenn, uh, I'll, I'll add on to the, yeah. to the show of thanks and, <laughs> and uh, mention how, how intriguing some of these ideas are. Um, I really like the, the historical lesson on the prototype of Monopoly. I, yeah. I really like playing games myself. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I'm gonna frame yeah. sort of two questions around yeah. that, that metaphor. The uh, Georgist model of playing the game, um, to me, as yeah. an avid game player, sounds boring and monotonous uh, and not very fun or enjoyable. Yeah. And I think that that uh, visceral reaction um, speaks to uh, a potential challenge to the, the presumed model of justice yeah. and the role of equality or, or income and wealth equality that, that you um, imply. So yeah. how would you justify this sort of system to, um, to individuals who, who, who don't uh, view a conception of justice to be as imbued with, with mandates regarding wealth or, or income equality. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of my question is about my favorite aspect of playing games, yeah. which is cheating. Yeah. Um, and in, uh, if I understood correctly, this uh, sort of artificial high reserve prices are deterred through taxation. Yeah. Um, both that and the transfer of ownership seem, would seem to rely upon some mechanism of enforcement. Yeah. So if the, the auctioning system of capital assets um, is, is leveraging wealth, it would seem to give a lot of uh, uh, authority to the contemporary unequal distribution uh, capital holders in contrast to the, the voice shares that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So. If I had sufficient wealth and valued my current stock of assets, I would just buy all of the enforcement resources, the jails and the, and the police squad cars, as a means of avoiding um, the, the tax liability or uh, granting myself the potential to, to raise artificial reserve prices. What, how, how, would, how would your system sort of cope with that issue? Um, great question. So first of all, um, you know, if you, I actually find the game really fun, mostly because of the novelty value when you play it with the Georgist rules. But I agree that if, you, if the game was always played by those rules alone, perhaps it wouldn't be quite as entertaining. But I think, you know, uh, I, my, my feeling is that people will always find interesting ways to be diverse and to differentiate themselves. And uh, that inequality of resources ties that up in a way that actually makes it harder and more contentious and than is necessary. So, you know, th the reason I think that our society is so beset by many of the ways that we have conflicts over identity politics is, n and, and, and many other societies as well, is not fundamentally because we can't have come to terms with difference. It's fundamentally because we've tied difference to capital. And we've tied stories about history and disputes about history to capital. Because the system of private property is so tied up with history and puts such a weight on history that if we took a step back from that, we could have actually more opportunity to have difference if we took away the strong ties between difference and entitlements to capital. You, I, I actually think this is even more stark in countries that are even more s sharply divided than we are. If you think about Israel and how much t tying there is between the story that we tell about the history of that land and the ownership of wealth, if you can pull those things apart, I think we could have much, many more interesting conversations about the differences and the differences in people's historical narratives. If we didn't have to dismiss each other's historical narratives 
in order to maintain our control over capital. So I actually find that an enticing opening to new forms of difference and to conversations about ways in which we're not the same, even if we are equal in our more equal in our capital endowments. Um, the, the second point is about gaming the system. And look, I don't think you need to change any enforcement institutions relative to the president, except letting some of them go in order to implement the world I'm describing. You just need to change the definition of stealing. What it would mean to steal in this world is to fail to evacuate a uh, asset that you no longer are the possessor of. We have lots of institutions that enforce things like that at present, right? We have institutions that enforce that if you get you know, evicted from your property that you have to leave it. That if you get foreclosed upon, you have to leave your property. Now yes, in this system there would be more reliance on enforcing that against currently wealthy people and less reliance on enforcing that against currently poor people. And there might be some political economy problems around that. But hand in hand with the greater distribution of the rents from capital to a broader population would go a change in the political economy around that. And how we bring that about, ultimately, I, I haven't given up faith in democracy. I believe that there are ways, you know, short of revolution, to change simultaneously the rents and the enforcement of capital. But, but the new equilibrium would be very consistent because rents would be reallocated in the same way that entitlements to uh, exclude would be reallocated. So internally it would be consistent. The transition is you know, more challenging. Uh, but I think it can occur through public mobilization. It can occur through some of these other proposals which are already in law that would start to equalize capital endowments and therefore make uh, the political economy uh, easier to deal with, et cetera. Yeah, go ahead. What potential do you see for quadratic voting with relation to campaign finance? As I see it, even with the current status quo of Citizens United, it could offer a potential greater improvement yeah. for people because it'll just be more transparent in the system instead yeah. of... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let me describe how it would work. And um, I think there are some constitutional issues with this, though. Is at least under the current Citizens United ruling, I don't think it would fly. That's Eric's conclusion. So imagine that we had the following system. So what are the main goals of campaign finance regulation? There are usually two, which are viewed as separate, but under quadratic voting would be the same. One is public finance. The second is limitations on the contributions of the very wealthy. Imagine that we had a more continuous system for both of these, where um, if you contributed money to a candidate, the amount the candidate would receive would be the square root of the money that you contributed multiplied by some constant that clears the market. So there would be taxes on the contributions of the, that are very large and subsidies on the contributions that are very small. So effectively, it would be like public finance based on poll figures, which is how it's done in Europe, sort of continuously combined with taxes on the contributions of the very wealthy. Um, and you can show that if you set that uh, constant right, by putting in an appropriate public subsidy, you can achieve optimal public goods provision. Um, so I think that's a very appealing mechanism, not just for campaign finance, but for more general funding of the media in an age where it's increasingly hard for journalists to get um, access to the resources that they need in order to provide the public goods that they, that they offer. Yeah. Quadratic voting would also might also um, encourage the wealthy to use the resources to try to convince people to use their quadratic. Absolutely. Voting. So it, it may encourage. Uh, I'm yeah. Out, um, not just the funneling of the wealthy towards paying a million dollars to get uh, a bunch of votes, but more efficiently, I think, trying to encourage their fellow citizens by by, by changing their minds. Yeah. To do. Absolutely. So I think one real. So I think one real problem with our current system is because there's so much focus on getting those just indifferent people over the hump. You that creates a very particular sort of soundbite culture, 
Whereas if you care about those people who are deep in one camp, but exactly how much they feel, then you would have a much more rounded public discourse. Yeah. Yeah, deeper one. Deeper one. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. This is yeah. this is really really stimulating. Um, so I have a question that sort of builds on um, something Professor D'Amico raised in his yeah. question, which is about. Um, so I. I, I I will take your word on sort of the technical side of yeah. this uh, this presentation, but my my question is about sort of the ju what's the sort of justificatory structure of yeah. the argument it's supposed to be fundamentally. Yeah. So one kind of objection I see um, uh, is that your proposal perhaps embodies a particular kind of attitude toward either physical space or land or yeah. um, or resources and. Yeah. Many citizens in liberal democracies might be might reasonably reject that view. So, think about a religious group that has a particular attachment to this place because they believe that um, they believe that some important event in their religious tradition happened here. Yeah. Um, they, under as I understand under your your scheme, they would. Be, they could maintain that monopoly by setting a very, you know, an extraordinarily, you know, extra, a, yeah. you know a, a monopoly price. Um, they might object that that's an unreasonable burden on their form on, on their form of religious expression. Yeah. So the question is, how do you justify this regime of property rights to people like that, or for that matter? Um, people who have more sort of communitarian outlooks, people who identify strongly as members of, um, people who strongly identify with either some kind of spatial or collective identity. So um, I think I have to take all three of those separately because the project is genuinely quite morally pluralistic. Mm. And so I think you have to take each question on its own terms. So uh, regarding the first, um, I, I think that, that, that the answers depend, even there, a little bit upon context. Because if you're talking about the context of, say, the United States and, like, say, the Branch Davidians or some, some group which maybe is attached to a place, but it's a place that is really not contestable, contested or there's not interest in contesting it among others, uh, I think you would simply say, on pragmatic grounds, that's simply not going to pose much of a concern for you because at a very low cost, you can preserve uh, exclusive control over that resource. However, if you think about a place like Israel, where things are fiercely contested by multiple groups that have claims like that, I think the, the answer is actually uh, quite powerful, which is it is simply impossible for the state to simultaneously fully represent all of those interests. And in a politically liberal society of any sort at all, we're, we're going to have to find some way for, to adjudicate those disputes that takes into account both a sense of equality across groups and a sense of the importance to those groups uh, of that in a relatively neutral way. And I think that actually, as, as coarse as it may sound, the price mechanism is quite a powerful way of potentially doing that. Because rather than allowing groups to use their historical claim to an asset, as a uh, justificatory basis for a monopoly right over that asset, instead asking them to pay for it and to compensate others for that access, I actually think to me that's a compelling liberal way to try to adjudicate those disputes. Now, that doesn't mean each group will view that as fully legitimate, but we can't simultaneously acknowledge the full narrative of all those groups in a liberal society. It's just not possible. So I think as a, as a means of adjudicating uh, to the best of our ability within a liberal society those claims, I actually think the price mechanism is quite a compelling way to do that. Um, in terms of communitarianism, I actually think that we didn't have as much time to go into it. But I think quadratic voting is actually quite compelling for a communitarian because quadratic voting fundamentally rejects the Dworkinian, Rawlsian perspective that private goods are the domain of the market. It says no. We can be as committed 
and serious and, uh, and focused on collective goods as we are on private goods. And we can put just as much emphasis behind the veil of ignorance in, in the you know, original position auction on access to collective uh, goods as we do to private goods. So I actually think it goes a significant way towards bridging the gap between a communitarian and a liberal uh, perspective along that dimension. And you had a third question, a, th a third group. That's that, why I mean, they're yeah. Right. Okay. So I had a question yeah. uh, about about information and yeah. privacy. Yeah. Um, and so I think in a sort of in a complete information world, everything seems to sort of work very yeah. well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very intriguing idea. Yeah. Um, but so I was coming back to your example from the very start, sort of thinking about this gold mine that yeah. somebody discovers, and they've got some gold <coughs> in the mine, and I've got this acre of land in yeah. the middle of I don't know California. Um, yeah. And it seems like, so I discovered that there's gold there. Yeah. And uh, it seems that I have a strong incentive not to raise my, raise my price of uh, how much I'm willing to pay for this land, because then everyone suddenly realizes there must be gold there. Right. You know, and there's, there's this, I mean, there's still asymmetric information. So, it's, you know, I'm thinking about a very simple model here, but, you know, in some sense, it seems like you know, we should. We I have to pull on the sort of. Uh, I still value this land at zero, but now everyone realizes that sort of. Uh, in some sense, some of this land occasionally sort of does. One of these land parcels does have. Uh, does probably have gold on it, so we kind of get this inefficient sort of transaction where everybody's buying all of these parcels of land just to find out information about whether whether there is gold under, yeah. under this guy's parcel of land to try and find out his asymmetric information. So, I mean, the, and I, I was thinking about this in the sort of the case of just the houses as well. Um, you know, you have this incentive to invest in ways that sort of is kind of hidden from view. And, and again, with the, on your yeah. company, sort of to try and keep your sort of informational rents um, in some sense hidden. And I, yeah. I was just thinking about, you know, this creating large, large additional sort of inefficiencies of yeah. allocations of investments, yeah. and I wondered what yeah. you thought. Yeah, so about. so that's a great point. Um, so what you are describing is what I would call investments in common values information acquisition, um, and there's actually a sense in which those are equivalent to. Uh, common values investments in improving the value. In fact, you can view there, 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 you can think of there as being a more general thing than either information acquisition or investment, where you're doing some combination of like, you're, you're affecting an information process that is not necessarily a martingale, uh, and that is always gonna be distorted by the, the tax that I'm describing. So both common values investments common values information investment, anything that is affecting some common value thing that's exposed to you is going to be distorted away from the first best by this tax. And, and by any tax on capital, by the way. All taxes on capital have that property. Um, so for example, uh, imperfect intellectual property rights encourage people to hold trade secrets, right? It's, it's exactly the same logic. So, I 100% agree that there are going to be losses to welfare by what you're describing. However, those losses are second order starting at this tax rate being equal to zero, and they get more and more severe as you go onward, and there's something that has to be quantified along with you know, the investment uh, losses that come from this tax and traded off against the allocative efficiency gains. So absolutely, they should tend to moderate the taxes. Depending on how large those are, you might want to set the taxes at, I don't know, half the uh, allocatively efficient rates, which are the turnover rates, or three quarters, or you know, somewhere in between. Of course, you need to trade that off against the fact that you don't want the system to be too cumbersome and complicated and, and fine-tuned and so forth. So I think that's, a, that's an extremely valid uh, point. It's not ever a case for zero tax rate. It's a case for moderating the tax rate somewhat, but it is, uh, but it is an important thing to be measured. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, 
very interesting talk. Yeah. Um, I'm worrying about bullying, bullying, bullying yeah. in the private sense, yeah. um, but also bullying in an economic sense, and maybe also bullying against minorities yeah. uh, written large. Yeah. So <clears throat> if I'm a little bit richer than you are, you are a little bit richer than I, yeah. Um, I can create like lots of problems for you in your uh, in your world, right? Yeah. So let's let's assume you have like a so, car. So no, I disagree with that. Okay. But, I'll, but I'll explain why. Okay, yeah, yeah. great. So, I, so I, think I, about I understand the I understand the idea of, of why you think so. But yeah, you, so, you're going so to explain I, it. Yeah, then I can be rather quick, right? Yeah. So let's assume that you have um, you have a nice car and yeah. you really like the car because it's your grandfather's yeah. car, whatever. And um, for some reason, I don't like you, so I threaten to buy your car. Yeah. So you will like um, increase the price um, <coughs> uh, for which you would be selling to, yeah. which you would be willing to sell the car, which effectively would increase your tax rate, right? Yeah. Um, same goes like for the economic example. So if I'm, yeah. if I'm a big company and you're an entrepreneur. I might to try, you know, like to to increase your taxes basically by threatening so, to buy your assets. Yeah, Same so, goes. So uh, that, just that, just the yeah, yeah, third yeah. point. So um, third point with all kinds of minorities, religious minorities. I I, 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 I understand the I understand the point. Let me try to okay. explain why why I don't think that's true. So uh, if you are setting your price at your willingness to accept for that asset, which you should always set it there or above that then that sort of bullying is about as effective as Donald Trump coming along to someone that he wants to bully and saying, I'm going to really bully you. Let me offer you 10 times what you're willing to accept for your house. That's not a very effective way to bully someone. <laughs> You'd actually be pretty happy if someone decided to bully you in that way, right? Um, now, if someone is setting their price dramatically below their willingness to accept for an asset, and hoping that no one discovers it, I'm perfectly happy for that person to be bullied because they're basically trying to undermine the operation of the whole system. They're, 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 the only people who are exposing themselves to bullying are people who are deliberately violating social norms. And by the way, people like that are exposed to bullying at present. If you are doing all sorts of illegal things, if you're doing corrupt, fraudulent things, of course someone can blackmail you, right? So the only people who in this system would be exposed to bullying are people who are deliberately not playing by the rules. Uh -huh. Everybody else would actually benefit from that sort of quote predatory unquote behavior because they'd actually be happy for someone to take the asset from them for more than they're willing to accept. I, I'm, I'm not agreeing to that. I mean, I can see some of your points, but so for instance, if we are interested, you know, like from a moral point of view about like having some diversity in in like a city or a very area, right? And then people like think about like white supremacists come in and they try to you know bully out like black families, like certain religious minorities to create some homogeneity. Well, it, look, it, it, this is a market system, and to the extent that people are willing to pay for discriminatory preferences and pay a premium for them. This system is not going to prevent that from happening. If you want to have regulations to stop that from happening, you'd have to do other things. But I think so that... The problem is that this system enables that kind of discriminatory uh, moves. Well, like, like any market system does. Because if people are willing to pay... But, but, it, but I think on average it has to undermine those. Unless you think that on average white supremacists are poorer than the people that they're bullying, because this, on average, redistributes wealth dramatically from the wealthy to the poor. And so it gives people all sorts of new opportunities to do that. So if, if on average, you think the people who are victims of bullying are wealthy people and that the bullies are poor people, then you might be worried that the system would, on average, go in that direction. I think I may have a last question. Okay, so, sounds good. So I'll ask in a kind of a general way. Yeah. You, you know, I, I love the project. Yeah. And not, not only because it's hard to track ideologically, yeah. ideologically but I love it for that reason, yeah. but I love it in content too. But what I just want to invite you to say a little bit more about yeah. um, is about incentives, how you, see, how you understand the incentives to work, the nature of the incentives to work and to yeah. labor, to be an entrepreneur, all the different kinds of work 
in the society you're describing. So you, so you say that private property inhibits, inhib can inhibit trading. And I, I get that. Yeah. And you're motivated by this idea to try to make assets, <laughs> to try to make assets liquidly available for new uses, yeah. including entrepreneurial uses and so on. So I just want to know, I want you to say a little bit more about how, how you see people being motivated to work. Yeah. So under, under state socialism, which your system is obviously not, yeah. I would say. Um, and there's infamously, they invoke the idea of the new man. They create a new person who's going to be motivated to work altruistically or selflessly and so on. Yeah. Your system has some of those components. It's going to have a transformation in the way we think about property, the way yeah. we relate to physical things in the world, yeah. and therefore I think a transformation in the way we relate, relate to one another. But it also has some other elements involved. So could you just say something, if you'd like to, yeah. just more generally about what, what are the incentives to work? Is there a new man? It's not a new socialist man. Yeah. What kind of a person or man is it? So there, there may be a new man under our system, but it certainly doesn't rely on or even hope for that sort of uh, a transformation. It relies very much on self-interest um, as the engine, though it hopes that gradually self-interest comes to be aligned with some more diffuse interests as well within the system. So. Uh, in terms of capital accumulation, or what you might call entrepreneurship, the incentive for that is clearly diminished in, in this system. Uh, there's a reduction in investment incentives, but it is not anywhere near eliminated. Um, it's reduced to one third of what it currently is, but that's far from elimination. And the new capacities and opportunities that people are able to draw upon, we believe would more than fully offset that in terms of the average level of entrepreneurship that becomes feasible. Um, in terms of true labor income, not capital accumulation, uh, we believe our system would be a dramatic increase in the incentive to labor uh, for several reasons. First of all, by eliminating the monopsony tax on labor or significantly reducing the monopsony tax on labor, I think you would eliminate by far the largest tax on labor, much larger than the other taxes that we impose on labor in our society at present. Second, by providing a new base for uh, uh, income to be generated, you would be able to directly significantly reduce taxes on labor. Third, by compensating people for the data that they create, rather than uh, basically having 100% tax on that form of labor, you would be spurring one of the most important forms of labor in our uh, emerging world. And finally, by offering people uh, who currently have no chance to, to labor at reasonable rates, uh, people who are living in poor countries, the opportunity to offer their labor uh, to the, its most valuable uses, you would uh, right there dramatically increase the base of labor in society in general. So I think overall this would be one of the most dramatic reductions in the taxation of labor income, uh, effective taxation of labor income uh, that you could imagine. Um, but it would somewhat reduce the incentives for capital accumulation. Yeah. I thought part of the egalitarian background of yeah. was the idea that there are so many, part of the, what we see in an unequal society like ours, yeah. there's so much creative potential that's not unleashed into our world, yeah. into our economy, and this system would unleash perhaps that kind of creativity. Well, I agree with that, but, but, I, but, I, but I think very directly, just in the most standard way, this would just dramatically increase the incentive to labor. Yeah. Glenn, thanks again. We're about yeah. out of time. Wonderful. There are refreshments in the lobby. And, and, and uh, I'm happy to sign books if anyone wants to get one. So. And uh, as a not-so-radical market, there are books for sale as well.